here that's in the gallery. Um, my first order of business here is roll call. Everybody is here. Mayor Hewitt is in the building. Uh, he'll be joining us shortly. Is there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we do have two uh, public meeting planning applications. And before we start, I have this passage I'll read out. Part of today's council and committee meeting includes statutory public meetings that relate to planning matters. All applications identified in the public meeting section of the agenda today will consist of a public meeting which will be followed by deliberations. Any decision as made at committee today on these matters need to be ratified by council on Tuesday, October the 15th, 2019. Each public meeting is required to follow the requirements of the Planning Act. In doing so, all members of the public in attendance today will have the opportunity to address the committee and make their views known before a decision is made. The process that will be followed is, staff will provide an overview of the proposal and the recommendations and the committee may ask questions of staff. I'll ask if the proponent wishes to address the committee, the committee may ask some questions. I will ask if anybody wishes to speak for or against the matter. Anyone wishing to speak is to come up to the podium, sign in by printing their name and contact information, make their comments, and then the committee may ask questions. Staff may be asked for clarification comments. The committee will deliberate on the matter. A decision by council to either approve or refuse a planning proposal can be appealed to a tribunal known as a local planning appeal tribunal on the basis of consistency and or conformity with provincial policy and or county, county official plan policy. In order to ensure your right to participate in any appeal process, you must either make oral submissions at the public meeting today or provide written comments to council before a final decision is made on the matter next Monday, being Tuesday because of, it is next Tuesday, right? Next yeah, next Tuesday. Any persons wishing to address council next Tuesday, either verbally or in writing, must do so by advising the municipal clerk by 12 p.m. noon, Wednesday, October 9th, 2019. If you want to, re receive a written notice of council's decision on a planning matter, interested members of the public will need to make a written request to the municipal clerk to be notified of the decision. And again, all speakers, please sign in the sheet at the podium. Our first planning application is on page one, PDD-32219 zoning bylaw amendment to fulfill a condition of consent Miller Land and Livestock Limited. And my understanding is Justin is at the podium to give us a brief overview. Thanks. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, uh, council staff and members of the public. Uh, before you today, we have an application for a zoning bylaw amendment to fill a condition of consent um, to add lands to an existing school in Jarvis, so the Jarvis Christian Community School. The subject lands are located in the geographic township of Walpole, concession seven, part lots five and six, also known as 2144 Highway 3. Uh, the subject lands are approximately 3.26 acres. They're vacant, they're currently being farmed. Um, actually, I think they, the, the crops have been taken off now. Um, and the, the Jarvis Community Christian School is located immediately to the west as well as its campus with a church a little bit further to the west from that. Um, the subject lands are generally surrounded by agricultural uses um, and they're within the, within the built portion of the town of Jarvis to the west. So the proponent is requesting to rezone subject lands to neighborhood institutional to permit the expansion of the existing elementary school. Right now they're zoned agriculture, so to bring them in conformity with the intended school use, that's uh, what the application here is today. The subject lands are located within the urban area of the town of Jarvis, so it's supported by the official plan. And Committee of Adjustment conditionally approved the severance, so the boundary adjustment to add these lands to the school on August 13th. 
Uh, the proposal is consistent with provincial policy, conforms to county policy, including the official <coughs> plan, uh, doesn't offend the city of Nanticoke zoning bylaw, and no comments were received from the public. If you actually look at the mapping there, the two pieces are what's intended to be rezoned to neighborhood institutional. The middle is actually where there's a, a drain that's buried under the subject lands. Um, so the conservation authorities and I believe our, our drainage folks in the county as well requested that, that remain zoned hazard land. The school actually intends to use this mostly as amenity sort of outdoor recess space, so there aren't issues with that. Uh, it's common wherever there are hazard land areas that remain on a property where they have that dual zoning. And the recommendations are as follows, and the second one you'll notice is that we recommend that it be approved for the reasons in the report. Are there any questions for staff from council? Great job, Justin. Seeing none. Uh, does the proponent wish to address the committee? Hello, my name's Maria Kinkle. I'm agent for the applicant here and just here in the event the committee has questions. Great. Can you just sign in? Will you? Yes, there. I will. Is there any questions or any clarification <laughs> from council? It is a pretty straightforward application, so I don't see any uh, questions or comments, but <clears throat> thanks for coming up. No problem. <clears throat> Takes longer to fill in my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Is there anyone else present who wishes to speak for or against this matter seeing none um, can I have a mover for this report councillor Patterson and a seconder councillor Lawrence questions comments call the question all those in favor and that's carried <coughs> our second Planning application is on page 12, PDD-37219, Zoning Amendment to, to Permit Year-Round Use, Belbin Construction. And Ashley's here to give us an, an overview. Good morning, council, staff, and the public. A zoning application has been received to permit year-round use by Belbin Construction. Uh, so the subject lands are located at 49 Stonehaven Road uh, in the Lakeshore node of Johnson Road. Uh, the subject lands are approximately 0.61 acres in size, and there's a dwelling currently under construction on the property. Uh, there's vacant lots to the north, residential to the east and south, and agricultural lands to the west. Uh, so the proponent is requesting to rezone the subject lands to permit year-round residency, uh, which currently allow seasonal residency. Uh, and a dwelling is under construction. Uh, so the subject lands are located within um, a, a subdivision which has 28 lots which all front onto Stonehaven Road and in 1992 council of the time uh, approved that the uh, holding be removed and since that time uh, the lots on this road have um, been developed. Um, most of them are used for year-round residency, uh, so the proponent is just requesting something that uh, has been permitted over the years on this road. Uh, so the proposal is consistent with provincial and county policies, which speaks to uh, this type of conversion. Uh, the proposal does not offend any town of Dunville zoning bylaw regulations, including uh, the lot frontage area, all of the setbacks. Uh, however, planning staff is recommending that a holding provision be applied to the subject lands to deal with uh, stormwater. Uh, so right now, uh, a drainage plan isn't required as this was um, an area that was developed. Um, the lots were created without a plan of subdivision and uh, the lots have been developed one at a time. Uh, so just to ensure that there's no uh, future drainage concerns planning staff is recommending that a holding provision be applied to the subject lands which allows um, lot to be rezoned but occupancy not to be provided until the lot grading plan uh, is approved by the county and so no uh, comments were received um, from the public or from any agencies uh, as such planning staff is recommending approval and the recommendations are on the screen before you 
Thanks, Ashley. Great report. Uh, Councilor Corbett. Thank you. I believe you addressed it, but the predominant concern of the neighbors has always been drainage, and it's being handled through site plan and a holding provision put on until such time as it's uh, to where it's required. So through the chair, uh, that is correct. So they would not be permit the building division would not be able to issue occupancy for the actual dwelling until they get the the lock reading plan approved by the county. So um, that is the enticement that you do the lock reading plan, you get the uh, you get the occupancy. Thank you. Any other questions for Ashley from council? <coughs> Seeing none. Thanks again, Ashley. <coughs> Does the proponent wish to address the committee? And again, please sign in. Sure. So I, I guess we see there's a holding provision. So you're okay with that and you understand What's involved? You've been building houses for a yeah, few I years. Yeah, I understand what's involved. Hi, I'm Zach Bellman. Uh, I would just like the council to, I guess, reconsider the, the grading plan. I just feel like it's a bit of a money grab because there's houses being built on the west, east, and south of me that do not require it. And uh, there's swales between each property and uh, large ditches all around the area. So that would just be my only concern. Okay, that's a good, we'll have to ask staff for their comments on that, Zach. Is there any questions specifically for Zach here this morning? Seeing none, but we'll address that question. Okay. Thanks, Zach. So maybe, is it, was it Tyson or Mike who wants to maybe take a shot at addressing? So Zach basically said the other apparently homes that have been built didn't require why this one, and maybe you could explain. Uh, through, uh, through to you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, staff's view is, is um, uh, and I think Councillor uh, Corbett picked up on this, uh, that a grading plan uh, to, uh, to look at drainage uh, as it relates to this property and, and how it interacts with, uh, with surrounding lands is absolutely critical in this area. Uh, we know there have been issues in the past uh, as development has proceeded um, without the, uh, the benefit of, of grading plans uh, and even in some of the developments uh, immediately north of this site where uh, we have had the requirement for grading plans um, we, we know from the engineers that have been engaged in those projects that uh, there have been some challenges in, in, in developing uh, workable uh, drainage and, and, and grading schemes. Uh, ultimately, there's, there's been a resolve that, that, that they've arrived at, uh, a, a solution, uh, but we know it's a challenge in the area. So, um, you know, while it is acknowledged, uh, as, as what Mr. Beldman said, there are some properties that have proceeded uh, in the past without the benefit. Um, or the requirement of a grading plan, that's, that's a, a legacy issue, if you will. Um, so where we do have opportunity through these applications to um, create those checks and balances, we, we do believe as, as staff it's critical. And again, I, I come back to the fact that uh, we know there have been some challenges in the immediate area, um, uh, and we know that there have been some um, uh, unique circumstances that uh, engineers have had to overcome with design. So. Um, I think the, uh, the view that we would uh, hold to is that it's a very, uh, very critical aspect of, of this development. Okay, so in saying that, I know the area quite well. There's a couple other builders that have built on Johnson Road, which is just a ball throw away. Did they require a drainage plan? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, absolutely, yes. Yes, so the ones that Zach are speaking about are older ones that have done maybe a few years ago. The ones that we approved in the last year all had to go through the same steps that Zach's going through? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, we've, we've processed applications in this area um, for year-round over the course of the last three years, and we've been consistent the last three years. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is there anybody who wishes to speak for or against this matter? Okay, Mr. Oh, Councillor Lawrence, you I have a question? Ask, I'm sorry, through the chair. I want to ask Mike a question. So essentially this is rewriting a past wrong with regard to site plan is to simplify it? Uh, through the chair, um, I don't know if I'd say it's rewriting a past wrong. Uh, uh, 
things were just processed differently decades ago. Um, uh, the the the, um, uh, the 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 emphasis on the technical aspects of applications wasn't as um, as pronounced um, in, in in decades gone by. Uh, we know a lot more uh, about the area. Uh, we know a lot more about how development um, acts, if you will, uh, on the landscape. Um, and, uh, and in particular, uh, with, with development proceeding as it has in this area, uh, we've, um, we've got a, uh, a significantly better understanding of, of, of some of the challenges as it relates to grading and drainage. Uh, and further to that, um, you know, one of the, um, uh, I don't want to say common, but uh, one of the, the property issues that we do tend to deal with from time to time relates to um, <laughs> neighbor disputes uh, as it relates to, to lock rating, water being uh, cascaded from one property to the other. Uh, and when you dig down, peel back the layers, you, you typically can conclude that it's, it's because of improper drainage on a property. So it just emphasizes uh, again and again the need for this, this type of thing to ensure that uh, not only is the property owner um, um, proceeding in an appropriate manner protecting himself, herself, but we're also ensuring that neighboring landowners are protected. So just to be clear, is there anyone here like to speak for or against this matter in the gallery? Seeing none, is there any further clarification? Re seeing none, do I have a, a mover for this application? Councilor Move Corbett. Them. I'd like to speak on it too. Okay, and can I have a seconder? Put it on the floor. Councilor Lawrence, Councilor Corbett. Yes, thank you. I know that the applicant feels it's a money grab, but I think he might see it prove to his, be to his benefit in the long run. I know it's a known concern in that particular area, and I know that I get a great number of calls from new homes being built and uh, changing the drainage, so it's good that he has it. It's something that will support him in the long run if he runs into that difficulty. But I do support the application. Okay. So seeing no other questions or comments, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that's carried six nothing. That concludes the uh, morning public meeting and planning applications. I'll turn the floor over to uh, Mayor Hewitt. Both motions on here? Yes. Okay. So a uh, mover and a seconder to get the two uh, items under motions of consent. Councillor Corbett, Councillor Redcalf, questions? Councillor Corbett? Yeah, if I may, on the uh, item number one, wastewater quality report, could you speak to any violations, major violations we may have had? And maybe if you can give me an update on the Dunville Water Treatment Plant, uh, how are we progressing that? When do we expect it to be finished and operational? Uh, through the chair, so I'll have two people come up to sort of tag <coughs> team to address those. So Stephanie can come <coughs> up first and just talk about the, uh, the results of last year's monitoring and exceedances. So Stephanie, if you want to just comment on those. Um, and those results are on page 169 of in your agenda. You can see the results. Uh, through the chair, my name is Stephanie Nolet. I'm water and wastewater technologist for the county. Uh, as to non-compliances, uh, we had no non-compliances for 2018. Uh, we exceeded a few objectives, which. Uh, the ministry would like us to uh, achieve, but there are no penalties for achieving objectives. So uh, we're doing great. Um, 
we can always improve, but uh, uh, there were no non-compliances. Excellent. Thank you. And then for the, the Dunville uh, wastewater treatment plant progress and where the status of that, I'll just have Phil come up and give a brief. Uh, through the mayor, thank you for your question, Bernie. <laughs> Uh, we're currently working to start up and commission the new equipment and unit processes. Uh, we're on target for meeting substantial performance by the end of November. And we're currently working through a delay claim submitted by the contractor uh, for on-site challenges that we incurred in 2018. Um, we hope to bring a report back to council before the end of this year detailing those uh, issues and resolve. Yeah, not too many people know in Dunville that that's ongoing, but you, would you touch on the amount of investment we're putting into that building? Sure. The, uh, the project in its entirety was about $8 million in capital expenditures. And I always hear that we do nothing for Dunville. That's a big amount out of the pocketbook. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Phil, mine's on a different matter, but great job, Phil. Yeah, so mine's on, uh, on Councillor Patterson's uh, recommendation and initiative to bring that Peacock Point speed reduction down. Um, I have a similar area, and I don't want to piggyback on it because I don't want this to not get voted in, but uh, Dover Street out in Port Maitland um, is out where the new Espinage is um, that's been refurbished. There's a... Dover Street is probably about a half a kilometer, narrow road, no sidewalks, a couple blind corners. Currently it's 50 there, and a lot of people walk it in the summer. It joins their one park, and then we have another smaller parking area um, further down. So I'd like to bring forward, and maybe staff can suggest whether I have to do a motion or what we can do to maybe reduce that speed on that small strip of road to 30 kilometers. So that's my only... Uh, question I have uh, not, which would, which would be a separate issue really it's not on this yeah item. I can get clarification later I guess one it was a good opportunity to bring it up here <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm at the debate I'm not last sure night if you, if you want to speak about last night's debate as well while we're on <laughs> yeah to, <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Justin was a little confused which government he was running for as well, or level anyways. But it was pointed out. Yeah. Jim, you came here all this morning, you never said a word. I know. I was I <laughs> 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 That's going to come up. <laughs> um, any other comments on the items that are actually listed on the agenda for <laughs> motions of consent? <laughs> Councillor Lawrence. Uh, back to the water, because I, I wanted to ask a question with not being a water expert, but I noticed here um, the E. coli exceedance for one month uh, with regard to Dunville. Um, can you explain that? Uh, is that, was it above provincial average? Was it not safe? Just where that is, because we all know E. coli has been deadly in different areas. I guess I should have waited to see more questions than that. <laughs> uh, through the chair. Um, so the objective was exceeded for E. coli at the Dunville Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, so that happens once in a while. It could be an issue with sampling, um, or it could be um, that there was actual E. coli in the water. Um, but it's not as uh, important as if it was drinking water, it's wastewater uh, being discharged to the lake. Um, so it is an objective, so we don't like seeing that. Uh, we want to improve that for sure, but we're not um, very worried or concerned about one exceedance. So it wasn't seen as like a, as a danger to, to the health of the No, it was not. Okay, yeah. So, so. Oh, sure. So on that, you said it was the wastewater discharge, so it's nothing to do with the potable water test, just to be clear. So, yeah, you could probably go swimming in that, but that's, yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I heard that correct. Through the chair, yes, you are very correct. <laughs> but you were glowing in the dark, <laughs> and you went swimming there. Okay. okay. Anything else on those uh, two items? 
All in favor? That's carried unanimously. <clears throat> Councilor Del Monte. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The first report under Community Development Services on page 179. It's report BME02-2019 regarding digital innovations and customer service enhancements update. Can I have a mover and seconder to get the motion on page 179 on the floor? Councilor Metcalf, seconder. Councilor Patterson, are there any questions on this report? Councilor Corbett. Yeah, I wonder if uh, you can explain the, the $50,000 we also always get in the contractors or consultants and the, you know, per, it's coming out of the permit uh, revenue and not taxation and the explanation there through the uh, through the chair uh, on the uh, the second question that's correct so this uh, uh, would come from the uh, the building permit cost stabilization reserve fund um, uh, so uh, the uh, the funds that are generated through uh, through building permit activity etc um, and in terms of uh, the, the first question, uh, the, the $50,000 is to, uh, to cover off um, all of the, uh, all the work that's required by the City View team to, to do the reconfiguration. Uh, two, two main things that are driving uh, that cost. It may seem significant, but it's a very complex uh, involved program. Uh, so the reconfiguration involves uh, a lot of person power to, uh, to get it to where we need it to be. Um, and what it will cover off, again, are, are two things. Uh, firstly, as, as Council is aware, we have uh, uh, recently, well, within the last year and a half, I guess it would be, uh, implemented new building fees. Uh, so all those fees have to be integrated into the system. Uh, and again, things need to be, uh, the system needs to be reconfigured to, um, uh, to accommodate all those, uh, all those new fees. So, so right now the system is set up with the old fees. Uh, so there's a fair bit of work that's involved in that. And then uh, I would suggest the, the bigger, more time-consuming piece uh, is to uh, develop all the workflows and then layer in uh, all of the uh, the necessary components uh, to allow for the uh, the plumbing plumbing permit um, process to be undertaken in a in a like manner as the building permit process is currently undertaken in City View. Uh, so the uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, of committee, uh, the plumbing uh, permit system is is something that was uh, it's a new program, newer program that was developed after. Um, the existing city view system was configured. Uh, so this is uh, essentially an add on okay. uh, and to that ensure that we have um, uh, identical workflows throughout the building division uh, so that all of our inspectors can, um, uh, can input their information, uh, issue permits um, uh, through, uh, through city view. This is, uh, this is a necessary step. And if I may, what's the benefit of having this done? Uh, through the chair, there are a number of benefits. Um, uh, for, for one, it creates a significant uh, degree of efficiency for our staff. Uh, they're able to um, uh, incorporate or, or, or um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, they're able to input all of their uh, uh, information uh, as it relates to permit uh, directly into, uh, into City View and they're able to do it uh, in vehicle. Uh, so uh, in particular, when uh, they're out doing their inspections, um, gone are the days of um, having to write everything down, come back to the office, and then input everything in the office. So essentially doing the work twice. This, this will allow uh, on the plumbing permit side to do everything similar to what we're doing on the building permit side of things now. Do everything in car, do it once. Uh, it eliminates um, uh, the degree of error, significantly uh, reduces the uh, uh, possibility of error. Uh, and again, it, uh, it eliminates having to uh, input the information uh, uh, twice. Uh, it's also um, um, essentially real time. So once the information is input in car, it's it's there for all the inspectors to access to see. Uh, so you could have an inspector out on site, uh, and someone in the office could, uh, in theory, uh, be able to view the information if they have to work through something. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Are there any other okay. questions on this report? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? It is carried unanimously. The second report is on page 182. It falls under our community partnership program and relates to Haldeman the Youth Soccer's project at the Caledonia Pavilion. A mover and seconder to get that motion on, on the floor. Councillor Lawrence is moved. Councillor Corbett is second. Are there any questions <coughs> pertaining to this report or the motion? No? Then I'll, I'll ask, uh, call the question. All those in favor? It is carried unanimously. 
Report number three is on page 189. Again, under the Community Partnership Program, and it's in regards to the lights along the Grand Christmas Display <coughs> Project in Caledonia Kinsman Park. I have a mover and seconder to get the motion on page 189 on the floor. Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Sherton. Any questions or comments on this report, Councillor Sherton? Um, yeah, the one question I have, and maybe a bit of a comment too, I think it's a great initiative. It'll look great. I know the area, and uh, it'll light that up. But I guess my thought is, like, why does it take till maybe they just have an extended timeline, but I see that they're hoping to have this done by 222, which three years out, I'm not sure why it's taking so long to have this great enhancement. Does anybody know what the rationale is for the timing? Uh, through... Uh through the chair to, uh, to Councillor Shurton, and I may uh, ask that uh, Katrina come up to, uh, to supplement this. She's worked closely with the group. Um, as I understand it, uh, the, uh, the intentions of the group are, are to purchase displays over time. Uh, so there's, there's a funding um, or a fund availability aspect to this. Um, it's a fairly significant undertaking to purchase all of the, uh, all of the pieces uh, at one point in time. Uh, so it's going to be staged. Uh, I think it's more cost effective um, or, or uh, uh, more suited to the, uh, I guess, the ability of the group to, uh, to do it over time. Uh, and then any, uh, also any uh, improvements, enhancements to the, um, uh, to the electrical system, you know, again, rolling those out over time. Uh, so that's, uh, that's my understanding of, of why it's, it's spread out over a five-year um, or multi-year uh, period of time. And yeah, so I don't know if there's anything that Katrina uh, yeah. can add to that. So uh, we, we might see lights there for this Christmas season, like, and a small display, potentially. Through, uh, through the chair, that's absolutely correct. The, okay. the intention is to, to launch, if you will, uh, in 2019, and then to augment to that it. over time. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments on the report, Councillor Lawrence? <clears throat> yeah, like over the course of the last few years, there has been displays down there of light, lighting uh, fixtures down there. Um, now they've come up with a grand plan, and, and a lot of the issues, uh, as Councillor Shurton was wondering over uh, why 2022 is a big thing, has been the electrical system, trying to find it, and then also try to tie it all in so it's consistent with the whole project. Um, they've, they've got an overall plan, which is great, um, that's consistent with trying to help, and just another win-win, uh, I think, for both a community yeah. group and uh, our partnership program, absolutely. Okay, for, for other questions or comments? All those in favor, it is carried unanimously. I have no other business that's been brought to my attention, so I'll turn it over to Councillor Corbin. Uh, the only thing I have is a petition to submit <coughs> for a, a possible sidewalk on Concession Road in Dunville. It's my intent to uh, put through a notice of a motion to be considered uh, for the next budget meeting. So with that, I'll pass it on. Do you want to give that Craig? And then I'll pass the information on to or the meeting on to Councillor Metcalf. I have nothing at this time. Is there any other business to be brought up under capital projects? Okay. I'll pass this over to uh, Councillor Lawrence. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Patterson. It's like the debate last night. We look alike. Um, nothing under financial services. So you'll pass it over to Councilor Lawrence. Councilor Lawrence, Metcalf Lawrence, yes. <laughs> Do I have to get a haircut to <laughs> differentiate us? <laughs> I just hide my gray a little better. Um, I have nothing here for corporate services. Um, I'll turn that over to Mary Hewitt with Corporate Affairs. I told you we had <clears throat> Seeing there's nothing there as well, we'll move on to uh, reports from uh, committees, boards, or commissions. Page 238, Minutes of Police Services Board. Comments? Councillor Corbett? I move it be accepted and I wish to speak on it. Okay, we've got a seconder. Councillor Metcalf. If you'll note that on our police service board agenda, service availability and officer compliment. At our last meeting, we, are further, we further explored this concern. In addition to those, uh, through medical leave, we are short three constables from our detachment. This leads to problems filling vacancies and back shifts. 
No, there is no question that at times when major emergencies occur, there is immediate and adequate response. Where we experience problems is with the day-to-day -day operational monitoring, such as speeding. This we find to be reactive rather than proactive policing. At our board, a resolution was passed to forward our concerns to our regional, area regional commander. We find the problem systemic with the delivery of service of the OPP. Other municipalities are expressing their concerns and are seeking quotes who align with other police departments. We had a good discussion at our police services board Zord meeting which explored a number of concerns as well. The OPP's response is that we have borderless policing this means in major incidents, there is police response from other detachments. This is mutual. As you can see, when we respond elsewhere, there is a vacuum left for services in our area. There are simply not enough police available. There seems to be a lack of interest as well on people entering the police force. The OPP must change their recruitment policies. I was quite surprised to see that if you want to sign up to be involved or be a member of the OPP uh, forces, you have to pay a $500 fee deposit to apply. I've never seen anything in that regard to applying for a job. That has to change. We were asked to comment on the OPP Police Independent Review Panel of Workplace Work Culture. Our feeling is that we get good service from the officers that are available. However, there are simply not enough of them. Our shifts are undermanned. <clears throat> this leads to frustration for the officers who sometimes have to double back. When we review our statistics, we, are const we constantly see responses that require two constables, domestic disputes, neighbor disputes, and 911 calls. Our you to date to number of 911 calls is 671, most of which are unfounded, but we have to investigate. So you send two police officers out to these calls and it involves their time and we don't get the services that we want. With our lack of police availability, we as a municipality apply reactive measure, measures. We get into speed cams, your speed signs, always signs and the requests for speed bumps. At the police services board, we are saying to council, that we do not believe we as a community are getting adequate and effective policing. We are pursuing our concerns to the regional commander. As chair of the board, I would ask the mayor and senior staff to follow up with the regional commander as well. This has to stop. We have to get the policing that our community deserves and that we pay for. <clears throat> Any other comments? Councilor Lawrence? Yeah, one of the things that we discussed uh, as well, and I think uh, perhaps Council had at some point with regard to town hall meetings, period, with information and everything, that we need to set up some town hall meetings with regard to uh, the police services and have an Inspector Carter there. Uh, I know the community keeps, uh, in Caledonian <laughs> Ward 3, the greater area, they keep asking about why isn't this done? Why aren't the police doing that? Why aren't they doing that? I think that with uh, town halls, that, that gives them the opportunity to be there and ask the question directly of those that are making the decision. So I think that we need to uh, move forward uh, with regard to making that happen sooner than later. <clears throat> One of the questions maybe that can be posed, I guess, at the Police Services Board is there's a culture of modified leave that continues to exist. and and because they're always understaffed due to a lot of those that are on modified <clears throat> duties. And there has been no provisions put into their contracts that, that puts a limit on, some, on, on the modified duty. And so there are officers in the detachment that are 
listed as modified but have been there for you know in excess of 10 years and so you know they're getting the 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 benefits of a full uh, salary as a constable out on the on the on the uh, you know in the community but they're on modified duty and and there doesn't seem to be any uh, provision in their contracts or provision in, in the in the system to either motivate these individuals to get off modified leave to come back to service or to terminate their contracts uh, as a result of them not being able to fulfill the duties as an officer and <clears throat> and at the same time it's those very individuals that are causing the anxiety and more stress that falls on the shoulders of those that are trying to uh, patrol and, and, and continue to police in the, in the uh, communities. And so I think along with, you know, the, the struggles of recruitment, it's, it's also that, that uh, you know, I want to, uh, you know, use the word cancer, if you will, but that, 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 that systemic culture that exists within the OPP that now allows for those to to take that 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 simpler route rather than follow you know what they've subscribed to or taken the oath to and that is to 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 be a constable to be a, an officer to be out on the street to provide the protection to the society and the communities rather than find that you know behind the desk uh, modified uh, position that uh, that gives them you know, certainly a whole lot, uh, you know, less, less stress as you, if you will, with respect to that position. And I, and I think that's part of that culture that has been created, not just in Haldeman, but along all through Ontario, which is why we're seeing, you know, a, a lack of, a, uh, of, of enforcement, but a lack of, of visibility simply because there are no officers out there doing uh, what that uh, title suggests they should be doing. Thank you, Your Worship. These are things that we have discussed as well. As you know, we have no control over operational and it's an administrative issue. And our concern is that uh, we have a contract to put for them to provide adequate and effective policing. They should uh, provide that. I know as a shift supervisor, if I required 10 people and only seven showed up, I'd have to get on the phone and phone other people. And if they didn't supply me with enough people, then they better start hiring. So it gets into a number of things that they're getting away with that we should be challenging. Well, we'll continue to push through. Councilor Lawrence. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you're uh, comments are bang on with regard to the culture and the modified duty. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a couple of retired OPP officers that are on our board that led uh, their detachments uh, sp uh, inspiringly. And they, they have told us different examples of modified duty that they experienced over the years. And the unfortunate part for us and society is called union and what they have protection. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how we can combat the concerns that you, or change those concerns that you have. And that's what we're up against right now. Uh, what we can do, we need to find solutions to get more people in the field, for sure. And, and I think if it's, if it's something that we can't change within the union, then it's, it's something that we need to change within our contractual uh, obligations and that those that are on modified duty for a period of time should come off the 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 list uh, of available uh, resources so that uh, when they're measuring their ability to pro provide adequate and effective policing as we always uh, use it's measured by those that are actually able to get in a car and provide that service within the community not not con continuing to to, to beef up their their contingent with with the number of officers that are on modified duty and have been on modified duty forever and a day and and so I think we have to find some way to 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 break that armor and that's uh, what we're hearing as I know you've been hearing going to other conferences with other municipalities it's the same uh, diagnosis that's happening across the province 
If I may, Your Worship, the word adequate and effective is very nebulous. It's like trying to nail jello to the wall. Yeah. I know that's your favorite saying. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, so just a question to our to our two reps on that board. So on the issue of the town hall meetings, are, are where is that going then? Are, are, have you actually talked about setting some dates? Because you know, those of us that are here from last term will, will remember. I remember uh, the inspector coming in with a survey, throwing data from the survey around, saying that the the uh, the. Uh, the opinion of the public, uh, the survey that was done, was, mm -hmm. was that there was a, a favorable response in terms of the service that the that the public was getting. But we we all here on the street, the level of the frustration, and the only way, you know, we're going to uh, give the public that opportunity to come out and and tell the inspector what they really think, about what's happening in their towns on a day-to-day -day basis. Can't keep hearing it from me because they're they're getting the same answer. They need to, he needs to hear it from the public, from the chambers of commerce, the other vested groups in the community, and the general public. So the sooner these town hall meetings are set up, I remember they used to have them years ago. I remember being at one at the Legion in Hagerstone. The the room was absolutely packed. So where are we going with that? Are, they've actually talked about setting. Thank dates. you for your question, Councillor Delmani. I can assure you there's not a street in Dunville that hasn't phoned me indicating they have uh, a problem with speeders. The indication is with regard to the meetings, I had a discussion where it was initiated in Brantford to have the town hall meetings at our discussion. Uh, the indication is we'd like to have at least three, one in Caledonia, one in Jarvis, and one in Dunville, and we're hoping to have one a month starting probably in November. So this is the indication. It's, it's something we need to do. They have to get their message out in terms of what's going on. Okay, thank you. And yes, we see that uh, report that comes back that about 85% of our community is satisfied with the policing and it doesn't uh, bode well with what I hear from the public. Well, we've seen lots of polling going on these days. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> maybe just a, a, an, op, a, an idea, but maybe the answer isn't necessarily uh, Phil Carter as the, uh, the person going around to the community. Maybe there's a role or, or a, a function that can be asked by the board that, that they establish a, a, a liaise individual that can, can be that person with the chambers and the different BIAs and community groups and so that they can set up a calendar as part of the priorities with the board, set up a calendar that, uh, uh, that they can meet on a, on a regular basis with all the local community groups to keep that information and communication flowing. And maybe that's not in necessarily Phil's purview, but somebody that, uh, that, that represents them can be that person. I know, in speaking to the inspector, he's receptive to the meetings. Well, we've, <laughs> it's got the talking part right, so we'll look for the next side. Mr. Mayor, I would just I would just encourage the board if if you can convince the the group at all to have one in Hagersville, because I we're we're inundated at the moment with with uh, truck related issues. You know, in council, we as a council look great with in terms of the bylaws that we're passing, the things we're trying to do to, to regulate truck traffic and truck turning. But I have to explain to the public that when we had an issue in Councillor Patterson's ward just outside the Hagersville near the quarries this summer, Haldeman County was all over with, with our bylaw officers and with off-duty police officers, which the taxpayers paid for to control that situation. And the question I was asked the other day at a chamber meeting was why, why aren't we attacking the issue of truck turning, now illegal truck turning, at the main intersection in Hagerzoe with the same vigor that we attacked that no parking issue on Mud Street. I can't answer that question. To me, the OPP need to back us up on, on that issue and, and so, that in turn and in terms of the other truck related issues which i think are real serious issues in the in the community 
we can pass all the bylaws we want, but, but until we get some backup and coverage from the OPP and they take the issue seriously, and God knows I, I, can, I can give them and the Chamber can give them all kinds of concrete evidence and examples of what, what has happened with concrete poles being knocked down, cars being sideswiped, cars being dragged, literally dragged 100 feet. We need, um, you know, we need a, an OPP presence there to, to police that kind of thing, or at least sporadically show their, show their face and try and uh, get a handle on what's going on there and start issuing tickets. So I'd strongly encourage you to have one in Hagersville because th there, is, there is some strong frustration on, on that issue, and I'm getting that almost every day. <clears throat> well, and I think that... Uh not to take away from that because I do agree that it's we're hearing it but I think it's consistent in every community we're hearing it and uh, it's it's uh, we're f we're well beyond the point of having conversations about what's not happening and I do really believe that we do need to 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 put these uh, to put the the OPP and anyone who can represent the OPP in front of the community to explain their issues and their the rationale behind how they're providing what they believe is effective, efficient, adequate policing. As I think we've all been taking those uh, those jabs for the last number of years at our public meetings, and it's time that uh, that they own it, and uh, they're they're getting well paid from the county and the municipality to uh, to provide a service, and I think that um, you know that service needs to be uh, uh, measured in the public and, and and through them, not us. So, enough with that. I'm going to uh, go on to uh, some more exciting. Uh, conversation we're going to start with item number three at uh, uh, as reports uh, starting at 11 a.m. we're going to start a little early because staff is here uh, so we're going to go to page 38 which is uh, ENV 0319 standard of care for drinking water Oh, I'm sorry. Before you do that, oh, you can stand there. That's okay. But uh, I, I, I did have a mover and a seconder, but we didn't actually accept the minutes. Those in favor? Uh, that's carried unanimously. That was six. Okay. Floor is yours. Okay. Good morning. Uh, before the presentation commences, I just want to provide a brief introduction, a little bit of background with respect to it. The standard of care, along with the drinking water quality management standard, was identified in the annual water quality report that staff brought forward earlier this year. Within that report, it was mentioned that staff would bring a presentation forward at a later point to provide more detail with respect to uh, the standard of care as it relates to anybody with decision-making authority over a municipal drinking water system. So that's why we're here today. Um, attached to the presentation report is a guide for municipal councillors along with the quality management system policy. Um, just for, to provide further detail than this report's going to go into, uh, the, or the presentation. Presentation will basically give you a kind of an overview of responsibilities. Um, any more detail you need, I'd recommend reading those attached documents just for your own information. Uh, the presentation itself was uh, co-authored by Joe and Jessica. Joe's uh, environmental operations technologist and Jessica's with the engineering capital water wastewater compliance group and she's also the QMS rep for the county. So they're going to run through the, the presentation and respond to any questions you may have. So with that, I'd, I'd invite them up. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, 
we had a recommendation from our drinking water inspector and to follow through with the council recommendation that we had earlier um, we're going to do a, a report on standard of care today uh, we have a few object we have a few objectives today so we're going to introduce some key drinking water con concepts and legislation we're going to summarize the standard of care and how it applies to senior managers and members of council we're going to review uh, or provide a few key drinking water documents that we produce within the county and then we're going to highlight uh, how our optimization program in the county uh, aligns with our standard of care so as mentioned earlier the walkerton inquiry really drives has driven change within the drinking water industry uh, a number of people were or got sick and some died from e coli outbreak in walkerton and the subsequent inquiry that or, uh, the preceding inquiry that occurred um, basically identified a lot of change within our industry. One of them was the concept of standard of care. Uh, this was taken directly from the inquiry and it states that given that the safety of drinking water is essential for public health, those who discharge the oversight responsibilities of the municipality should be held to a statutory standard of care. And that was a quote uh, from the inquiry from Justice Dennis O'Connor. Another concept coming out of the Walkerton inquiry uh, was the multi-barrier protection approach. Uh, and it looks at drinking water from a source to tap perspective. And it applies, uh, it creates barriers or po you put policies and procedures in place to ensure protection, oh. to preserve protection of all the barriers within the drinking water system. Um, we have in the county embraced this pr approach and we do have individual barriers within our systems. Uh, in all the different avenues of, of uh, source water protection. The ministry has also adopted this and they, in their policies and procedures and regulations, they've incorporated kind of the multi-barrier approach within them. So the Safe Drinking Water Act was introduced in 2002 and it basically applies to all municipal uh, treatment and distribution of drinking water. Within, that re or within the act, there's a number of regulations. Some of the key regulations or notable ones within it are Ontario Regulation 128, which basically specifies that to operate in our drinking water systems, you have to have certifications. And that includes, uh, uh, you'll have to have training and, and qualifications to do so. Uh, there is also Regulation 169, which is the drinking water standards. And that's the quality of water that we have to produce and the standards that we have to apply. And that includes microbiological, uh, radiological, and chemical standards. And then Ontario Regulation 170 is the drinking water systems regulation. Uh, that's really the, the mm. top regulation that we apply within Haldeman County uh, when we treat the water. And that includes things like minimum sampling requirements, uh, annual, san uh, annual reporting requirements, as well as um, requirements for uh, adverse reporting if we had an issue with our sampling, how we respond to that. Within the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, there's a, key, a couple key sections that are applicable to, to really the county. Uh, and that's section 11, which specifies duties of owners and operating authorities. Uh, it's a, important to distinguish between the two because there is a bit of a difference. So from the county perspective, the owner is considered the count, Haldeman County and any of the managers or people who make decisions on it, its behalf. And then the operating authority in Haldeman County, we have two operating authorities. So our distribution and collection staff are an operating authority to manage or, or operate our distribution system. And then we contract the only operations to manage or as the operating authority of our water treatment systems. Uh, a couple key responsibility or legal responsibilities, you'll notice that they kind of apply to the owner and the operating authority. But some of the key ones are, uh, we have to make sure that we supply water to our customers that meet all the standards that I talked about previously. Uh, we operate in accordance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. We have staff, our qualified staff members in, uh, applied in the systems, and we keep our systems in good state of repair. Um, probably the most important aspect of this act is the concept that although we contract out our operations of our water treatment system, 
the county can't uh, divest themselves of the responsibility of the drinking water system. We are still ultimately responsible for that drinking water system, even though we do contract it out. Um, something that I think is a good, it, I brought up and I put up here, uh, is an incident that occurred in North Battleford and it speaks to the requirements of uh, Section 11 of the Safe Drinking Water Act and Section 19, which we'll talk about briefly. But in North Battleford, uh, they had a cryptosporidium outbreak which caused a number of illnesses within their system in the drinking water. Uh, and the inquiry that occurred after, their, after the fact identified that there was um, their wastewater treatment plant was discharging upstream of their water plant, so it was basically supplying or impacting their source water. Um, their treatment staff uh, brought issues to the table to council and to their management, identifying that there was issues and concerns. There was, they, the treatment facility wasn't capable of treating the raw water that they were receiving. And then because of that, there was uh, employees took some time off uh, stress leave because they they were not able to deal with the issue and there was an uh, extended period of time where staff there wasn't a supervisor on site for the staff which speaks to a number of the requirements that I talked about earlier um, in section 11 there was the province and the city were sued and there were multiple settlements that out of court uh, totaling to date approximately about seven million dollars Something that's important to identify is that at that time the standard of care was not in place. So through the Safe Drinking Water Act today, individuals may have been charged. Um, the municipality and the province were charged, but not individuals. So that could change with standard of care. So Section 19 is standard of care. Uh, it came into effect in 2013 as a recommendation through the Walkerton Inquiry. And it extends legal responsibility to people with decision making over municipal drinking water systems. So who does it apply to? Um, it basically applies to any person who makes decisions on behalf of the drinking water system. So that could be members of council, that could be senior managers, uh, managers within the system or supervisors as well. Uh, so what are the requirements of standard of care? Do the requirements, it, 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 you have to exercise a level of care, diligence, and respect to decision making, and you have to act honestly, competently, and with integrity with the safety of the drinking water system uh, first and foremost. And in short, uh, you basically are expected to practice due diligence when making decisions affecting the drink municipal drinking water system. So there's penalties involved now, um, and the penalties if you don't comply with the Section 19 of the Safe Drinking Water Act, they could apply to the corporation, individuals, or both. And they are significant, uh, with the maximum penalties for the first offense being $4 million and up to five years in prison. So I talked about kind of the penalties and what the requirements are. So how do we maintain or how do you maintain an appropriate level of care? Um, probably one of the most important things to identify is that there isn't an expectation that everyone's an expert in drinking water. Um, that's not reality, so the ministry has accommodated that. Uh, but there is an expectation that you're knowledgeable of the systems and that you ask questions and seek answers. Um, if you can seek information from um, people who have the experience or the credibility to, to give that information. So if we get reports from engineers, lawyers, um, or anyone who has credibility, we can rely on those reports to provide or to make decisions. Um, also important to note that if staff, you can rely on staff knowledge and expertise when making decisions, as long as their credibility or they have the credibility to warrant. Um, making those decisions. One of the biggest things is the expectations with standard of care is the concept of being informed and staying informed. Um, so there is a wealth of information that's available to, to members of council and managers. Um, and those include, we have source water protection plans. We have a drinking water inspection report that's released annually by the ministry. Um, but there's two key documents that we do, we uh, release within the county that are sources of information for you on our drinking water systems. 
And those are our annual water quality reports, which we brought earlier this year in February. And then our quality management system operational plan, which I believe both which is, which is attached to the uh, council report. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica um, to speak about those. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good morning, everybody. So as Joe mentioned, we develop annual water quality reports uh, each year. They're sent to the ministry, they're given to council and SMT, and they're also posted on our website for all the residents to take a look at. Um, there's one for each of our distribution systems. There's the Nanacoke drinking water system, uh, the Caledonia Cuget, and Dunville. So it, in general, the reports give an overview of each system um, and the details of of each and then the water quality <coughs> sampling results and that's operational regulatory um, lead sampling things like that it goes over the water flows so um, totals for raw and treated water going out and it also goes over the regulatory compliance which includes um, how we did on our inspections and uh, treatment disinfection things like that and also it gives a summary of our quality management system, which I will get into more detail as we go along. But there's a lot of good information in those reports and we definitely encourage you to read and ask questions. So I'll give some of the 2018 report highlights uh, for Cuga and Caledonia. Uh, we had no issues within the drinking water system. There is uh, 5.3% increase in water demand. And over the course of the three reports, I'll touch on uh, water demand increases, but they're usually due to, could be weather, fire protection, um, development within those areas. And we are improving our approach to water accountability. So that will also help in uh, determining that percent increase. So for Cuga and Caledonia, um, we had 100% ministry inspection rating. So the way that works is it, the ministry does a risk-based annual inspection of each of the drinking water systems. And it's from a regulatory perspective, they look at administration, water quality, um, things like that. So uh, in 2018, 75% of systems inspected had a rating of 100% and 99.8% uh, of approximately 700 municipal drinking water systems received an inspection rating of over 80%. So we're doing really well um, in comparison to other municipalities. Uh, for the Dunville drinking water system, again, there were no compliance issues. Uh, we did have one adverse, but that was um, rectified right away. Again, uh, same as Cuga Caledonia, about a 5.3% increase in water demand um, and 100% ministry inspection rating, so very well. Uh, the Nanacoke drinking water system, again, no, um, no compliance issues, just one during the inspection, a chlorine pump was not installed as per our permit, and those are rectified right as, as soon as they're brought up. And that gave us an inspection rate of 96.9%. So again, very well. Overall, our drinking water systems are doing good. The second document that Joe mentioned was the Drinking Water Quality Management Standard, or DWQMS. Um, the county implemented and received accreditation for our program in 2009. It was mandated through the Safe Drinking Water Act in 2006, so we had a couple years to kind of develop a good plan and obtain our accreditation. And now it does only encompass our water distribution systems. Uh, does not encompass the drinking water treatment plants, our contracted operating authority, Veolia. They're mandated to have their own DWQMS plan and receive accreditation just like we are. Um, and that's enforced through third parties. There's two companies that um, do external audits on your plans in Ontario, and they do that on behalf of the ministry. And failure to obtain that ac accreditation results in the ministry and province taking over facility operations. So it's really important that we, we do our best to achieve uh, the requirements. And then that, that whole cycle drives continual improvement. You know, you, you build a plan based around your drinking water system and distribution, and you put procedures in place, and then you act upon those. You know, you do what you say, 
and then there's checks and balances in between to make sure you're doing what you say you're doing and just making sure that things are going well and that's where the improve comes in because you're constantly looking at those checks and balances and trying to improve what you do from a public health perspective. So the standard um, is based on policies. The county has three policies in our DWQMS plan <clears throat> that um, we strive to achieve throughout the year and all the time. And as council, um, you should be familiar with these policies and adopt them as part of the commitment and endorsement to the plan. Our first one, of course, is ensuring that all of our systems comply with regulatory and legislative requirements to supply safe drinking water. Um, the second one is, is financial support to maintain that infrastructure integrity and that consistency of delivery to our customers. And then the third one is um, to review and update the operational plan and continually improve that system and uh, communicate with residents. <laughs> So just a quick um, overview of what the DWQMS plan essentially is. It consists of 21 elements um, focused on the commitment to the county's policies that I just mentioned. Um, so some of the key elements, like I said, the commitment and endorsement, that's, that's everyone who directly affects drinking water as the system owner and staff to sign off on the plan and commit to uh, the policies that I mentioned. Uh, another important one is the risk assessment and our risk assessment outcome. Um, that takes a look at your distribution system and you know what, what are the risks, what are potential hazards within our system and how do we address those? You know, what's the likelihood that they could happen, consequences and, and things like that? And then you put plans in place to address those and try and mitigate any risk to the system. Um, another one is the organizational structure, roles, responsibilities, and, and authorities. It addresses everybody's role within our drinking water system and the responsibilities each staff position has within the drinking water system and then helps to make sure that everybody's competent and capable in, a, in achieving those, those roles. Another one is infrastructure maintenance, rehabilitation, and renewal. That one is basically what it says. You want to make sure that your infrastructure is in good shape and that you're constantly maintaining it to ensure that um, sustainable supply. Emergency management, we're always looking to mitigate any sort of emergency, potential emergencies within the system and prepare as best as we can for those. You can't prepare for everything, but through response plans and things like that, we try and as prepared as we can be. And then the one that drives the entire plan is continual improvement. We always want to try and do better. We always want to build on the basis that we've established. So just a bit of a system update. As I said, um, on an annual basis, we, we do review the plan and we try and make changes and improve upon them. Uh, we conduct internal audits to sort of check ourselves to make sure that we're on track and doing what we say we're doing. But we also have the third party um, come in and do our external audit, which is one of the reasons why we're here today based on our previous external audit. Um, they go through each of those elements and try and recommend improvements or changes that would just benefit your system. And one of them was to better um, educate our council and committee to have them sign off and make sure that they're knowledgeable of the plan. Um, and also to better define roles and responsibilities within the plan. So based on the external audit, we try and address all of their recommendations just to make our plan better because it's only going to help us in the end. And then we, we meet annually with our management staff to communicate everything from the year and all the improvements that we're able to make. So all of these 
these programs that we talk about and implementing them and meeting regulatory requirement, the foundation of that comes from the county's optimization program. Uh, the program has achieved great success through our continued commitment to these values and the greater good of the county and its, res and its residents. Uh, we started this program in 2009 and we've, we've continued to build on the basis of these fundamentals. So all of our decision making in the drinking water system is always driven from a public health protection standpoint. We always ensure that regulatory requirements are consistently achieved and we demonstrate that due diligence all the time. We also try and tap full capacity of our infrastructure and our plants and things and avoid unnecessary capital expenditure. So part of that is deferring those unnecessary capital expenditures or just better planning, which results in long-term savings for the county. And we try and provide the leadership to enhance water treatment. We focus on skills development, communication, and team problem solving. Uh, this, this approach reinforces some of the concepts mentioned before, like the multi-barrier approach. And Haldeman County is a leader in optimization. Not everybody is doing this or taking this approach. And so we try and strive to continue to be that leader and do the best we can within the county. As you can see that the clean, safe, reliable drinking water is always at the top of the pyramid because it drives all of our decision making and all the boxes um, around it, you can see that the arrows go both ways because they continually work together to achieve that clean, safe, reliable drinking water. <clears throat> so the administration box is, is where all of us sit. Um, we, we look to provide resources, whether that be budget and staffing, uh, policies, you know, approving any sort of changes, things like that, and communication always and fi effective financial planning. So we've, through this program, we've saved a significant portion of money over the years. And that's in part to um, our team and council giving us that, the, the resources. Uh, and the design and maintenance box also work together. You know, we effectively plan for upgrades or expansions and defer any unnecessary capital expenditures and having effective maintenance programs in place only drive that eff effective planning. And it gives us a capable plant, which operations then takes to the next level to provide that clean, safe, reliable drinking water. So things to remember, be vigilant, uh, don't be complacent, always ask questions and seek information. There's always people here to provide answers and advice. Be informed. As Joe mentioned, you don't have to be an expert. You can seek advice from experts and act prudently on that advice. And it's your duty. There are legal consequences for failing to meet the standard of care. But as per the above, there's, there's ways to mitigate that. That's it. That's it. <clears throat> Dr. Sheridan. Uh, great presentation, Joe and Jessica. One question I thought of, how does the water we get from Hamilton apply here, like, are they responsible? What happens if something happens to their water? I'm assuming we're still, at the end of the day, still responsible, but how does that relationship work with Hamilton and whose responsibilities does it fall on? Yeah, through the chair, uh, each municipality will have their own responsibilities. Hamilton is responsible until the point in which Haldeman County assumes responsibility for it. At that point, then Haldeman County then becomes responsible for the drinking water. So both have responsibility because it's just shared source, but we assume it once it crosses our boundary, then it becomes our responsibility. Okay. Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Just um, through the chair, just a question I, I didn't understand. Um, on page seven on your 2018, the highlights, when you're talking about the Nanocoke system, can you just explain to me what a drinking water works permit is? Is this something that happens after an inspection or is that kind of what your system shall entail? I just didn't understand what that was. Through the chair, a uh, drinking water perm works permit, uh, we have to obtain them in order to get accredited. We had to obtain them, and it basically identifies all our infrastructure within our drinking water system. Right. So the ministry will take that document, and when they do their inspections, they'll go through and ensure that everything we claim is in our system, and our drinking water system is there. 
So when it identified that one of the pumps was not installed as per the drinking water works permit, uh, what it was was we had a pump that was identified as a, a rechlorination pump and it wasn't connected so it wasn't usable at that time although in the county we don't use that in in our drinking water at the Hagersville booster station we don't use that pump it was still there and wasn't installed as per our permit thank you thank you a couple comments and a question thank you for your informative presentation and then I would like to reach out to Jeff Oaks and thank him for addressing our immediate concerns in Dunville for wastewater and water concerns. It's muchly appreciated. And to wrap up, I guess the bottom line is that we are providing safe <coughs> drinking water, which is monitored on a continual basis. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Lawrence. Uh, yeah, just a question here with regard to the increase in the water demand. Um, it's good to see that Dunville's on pace with Caledonia for development because you're both 5.3% like us in demand. Um, Jar or Nanticoke is 9.7, almost 10%. What do you attribute that to? Um, through the chair, a lot of Nanticoke is attributed to uh, we had an increase in our industrial demand. So uh, basically, Stelco and their facilities use a lot of our drinking or municipal potable water um, we did see an increase in their demand um, and we also had this year we had to re refurbish some of the standpipes so we had to remove some of the water so a portion of that water will be attributed to that and you'll see an increase through some of the operational functions that occur very good okay. um, you mentioned the uh, <clears throat> that the county assumes all liability even though we do contract out to Viola for management of the system. What liability do they assume in the sense that if there was something that happened, is that liability in the contract and transferable or are we simply 100% responsible? Um, through the chair, they, they do assume responsibility based on the regulations and what the responsibilities mm -hmm. are. The county is, will ultimate, ultimately be responsible um, to ensure, we have to ensure that we're knowledgeable what they're, what they're doing on site. Uh, we put them in place as long as we cover our bases and we have that, um, we will be covered off in that regard. But ultimately, the ministry comes to the county, and, and the expectations are that the county is the one responsible for this. So we, we in essence, assume that responsibility to, to, to some extent. Just, just if I can add to that, in the contracts with Veolia, um, we do secure a certificate of insurance uh, from them at a, at a significantly higher level of coverage than any of our other contracts. I believe it's around $20 million coverage. So we do have that transfer of risk okay. that we can draw upon. Okay. Very good. good. So just to wrap up, um, I wanted to thank Jeff and Jim and um, our presenters today. Uh, this is, you know, this is an important topic and uh, there's a lot of detail that was presented today. Um, but it's really important for our citizens to have uh, transparency in terms of um, the drinking water and the quality. So essentially what I took from the presentation was at the end of the day, whether it's contracted out or not, staff and council retain responsibility for ensuring that we have safe drinking water. We've got robust systems and processes in place, and that includes uh, qualified staff monitoring as well as the significant capital investment the Council's made in those systems. And we're meeting all our uh, ministry inspection regulatory compliance requirements. And I th wanted to emphasize that our optimization process is not only leading edge, and we have lots of municipalities that come and look at it, but um, you know, the presentation noted that we, we've in fact saved $20 million as a result of getting more out of our system, and that has a, a direct impact on the rates. So thank you to all the staff. You do a wonderful job. And uh, there is a recommendation on page 38. I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Del Monte, Councillor Lawrence, 
Um, you'll see the three recommendations on that page. All those in favor? That is carried unanimously. So we'll go to item one. So the project update from the CAP team with respect to the exciting and new CAP building that will be a lot warmer when it needs to be warmer and a lot colder when it needs to be colder. <laughs> right now it is cold in here. My hands are freezing. Nice. <laughs> That's comfortable. Oh. It's alert. <laughs> it's like, I thought, it's just coming straight on us right here. Tough on a bad back. <laughs> when the heat's on though, it's like, oh my God, it's really hot. When it's cold, the air's on. <clears throat> Through the chair, thank you for the opportunity to come back and provide another update on the central administration building construction. I'll, I'll roll through a bunch of, of slides and if you got some questions, I'll answer some questions and there's, there's a few photos in it, but in general go through, through progress and then uh, construction progress to date and then going forward. Um, so to date, roofing is 99% complete. There's, there's a few, few items still outstanding for roofing. Small entrance canopies and um, the east side of the sloped metal roof on the council chambers. But in short, they're waiting to come back one time to, to finish all the roofing. Insulation, elect electrical services and equipment complete. Wiring connections are underway. That's been ongoing for, for quite some time now. Um, the spray foam insulation is complete also. There's, there are some small tie-in areas for the spray foam. They're waiting one last shot to touch up some, some loose ends, I guess you'd say, with the, the spray foam insulation. But if you've been by, you can see that generally the building has is, is been, been sprayed and insulated. Insulation of the heating, <laughs> ventilation, air conditioning equipment and ducts are complete. Controls uh, are underway. Um, the same thing, it's been ongoing for, for quite some time on the inside of the building, although the outside of the building doesn't look like uh, as good as the inside right now, we'll say. Insulation of the fire suppression system is complete, piping and sprinklers. Insulation of the interior steel studge and drywall is complete, tape, mud and sanding is underway, and exterior masonry complete. Uh, there is a small uh, section of masonry that still has to be complete under the one large curtain wall at the lobby area, but generally the masonry is complete. Continuing on uh, construction progress, installation of the composite panels are underway. They've been underway for a few weeks now. It started on the west elevation, which most people wouldn't see unless you're coming up Chippewa from, from Muncie. Um, and I'll, I'll talk further on the, on the composite panels in, a, in another photo. The, Core slab floor topping is complete, and, and if you're not familiar with what that is, back through the last year, you'd see all the planks, the core slab planks, the, the, the flooring go through each one, and um, now there's a topping. It's a self-leveling type topping that accepts your, your floor finishes. And the same thing, I'll have a picture on that. Painting and floor finishes are underway. Um, generally, Floor finishes and whatnot are tiles and bathrooms, small areas, not the larger area, open areas right now. Um, light fixtures and seal tile grid insulation is underway. Um, I'll have a, I've, uh, there's a photo later of the third floor. The, the, the grid wasn't in place when I took the photo, but um, they're proceeding um, quite well with that stuff. Exterior landscaping is underway. The intention, oh, well, the, the Thorburn Street ditch has been graded and ready for topsoil. They're, they're hoping to be in last week with weather. They, they got postponed. Same with the outlet swale from on, on the west side of the building to the stormwater management pond behind the arena is prepped and ready. So both those areas are, are ready for top or ready for topsoil and sod. Um, the Chippewa Street Road construction is underway. Um, it might not be obvious or visible, but they, they, they're actually, they're, 
yeah. they're, they're, oh. underground. Under, yeah, there's some underground, but they uh, they had hoped to start last week again. They don't want to make a mess. You get in there last week, you make a mess. So uh, we missed a really nice window two weeks ago of, of really good weather, and it's unfortunate, but. Um, they are there, they're, they're removing the asphalt, so we're reconstructing the portion from basically across the, the, uh, the building is, is being totally reconstructed. They're in there removing the asphalt today and you'll see earth excavation and gravel and, and whatnot going. But they have been working on um, some underground, some store, storm sewer and whatnot prior to, to the reconstruction. Um, are they gonna widen Chippewa Street? Correct, for... Um, most roads, oh sorry, through the chair, most roads in, in um, Cougar are half roads or they're built slightly smaller than current standards. Correct. So it is going to be widened out to, uh, to seven meters, three and a half meters for each driving lane. Okay. So it'll take care of that massive gully on the north side? Yeah, every, it, it, uh, we'll blend them out as best we can at the, the towards Muncie end. It's, uh, there is a, a little more back slope to that, but we'll try and address it the best we can through through the final grading um, the throat at Muncie the idea is is uh, uh, Chippewa will line up on the other side of Muncie so they built with the old throat the curbs and whatnot were there and we'll just sort of match what used to be there theoretically it well no, the only reason I'm asking is because when when Chippewa was open before the construction the stop sign was brought way back and the curbing was brought way in so there was a lot of kind of boulevard well wasted space to the north because it looked like eventually that that could be widened so that basically it showed where the road allowance should be but I'm just concerned because of the the mass of uh, gullies and ditches on the north side of Chippewa mm -hmm. that uh, have been brought to my attention from concerned residents along there through the chair, correct. Um, the widening is generally to the north side of Chippewa. Um, the, the old standard of, of ditches, and I think the new standard of ditches, the idea is when you build your road base is that your ditch is lower than the road base to allow the, the gravels to drain. So once you get, once it's final graded topsoil and sod goes in, the idea is that it's a manageable slopes, three to one, hope ideally maximum so that they're maintainable. Um, did I touch, if I didn't touch on the insulation of windows and large curtain walls um, still being outstanding, uh, we did get an update uh, on the contractor and I think you've heard this previously that there was um, an issue with the subcontractor. Um, they've sorted out with the bonding company and we've been no notified that we should see those large curtain walls proceeding shortly and I'll, I'll touch on those in a photo. So this is north north perspective, um, Thorburn Chippewa Street, where on the well down here in the last starting last week, you'll notice that the composite panels are going up. Yeah. So if you're coming, say from Dunville, and you're coming, you might not see them. But the idea is is that they've and you'll see another picture. They're going to start here, and they're going to wrap themselves around the building. It'll take them into November to finish those composite panels. Uh, you'll see another photo uh, coming up next. They are small panels. Each one has to be cut, so they cut them on their CNC uh, machine. Um, wow. And it, it is a pretty labor extent. Yeah, it's, it's, everything's done from a lift, so you'll see. Uh, if if you've days. had a look in the last I'm couple, four days. couple of days, the rails, so they, they, they're along here with rails, putting the rails on to accept the cops of panels. But the road construction, as I say, is underway. Brings They're removing nice. the asphalt, and uh, hopefully if we get a good week, they'll, they'll eat through this and get gravel back in, and, and we'll, we'll be able to move on. This is uh, taken a few, probably three weeks ago now, three or four, um, but it's a west perspective from on Chippewa looking mm -hmm. east, and it's, uh, so this, this here, Let's see if I get this. All right, there it is. This is the back council chambers. Um, that's a sloped metal roof over council chambers. This is where these panels are. Um, that was a mock-up 
section and now they've they've started wrapping around onto Chippewa heading east around the building. <laughs> As I say, it will be a bit before they, they <laughs> finish those. But the interior is pro progressing. Um, That's good. This is a third floor open office uh, workspace. On the, the left, this picture here, this will be the workstations, so the, the office furniture work, workstations. Um, open, open concept, lots of light. When the picture was taken, there was no T-bar in. Um, the mud and sanding was underway, but now you, if you go in there, the T-bar is in, it's ready for a tile. Um, this is an example of a manager's office, a couple of manager's offices. This is a large meeting room. Um, it'll have glass on either end, so you can see, as you can see, you can see through it. Um, but there is T-bar in this area now, it's being painted. Uh, the flooring won't go down. Once they put the flooring down, they have to protect it in these open areas. So they'll hold off until they get generally everything done. Then they'll put the flooring down and they'll, they'll have to protect it. This is uh, council chambers, the, the interior stone accent wall. So the, the podium will be in, in between these two. Uh, there will be a ramp that comes up either side, but this same natural stone from the outside is brought inside. Um, there's actually significantly more done in here since I took the picture. There's, there's some um, steel accents and whatnot at the back as well. But this will be up here will be a, a ceiling and then on the slope roof it will be a wood infills on the, on the exposed ceiling inside. Nice. So, curtain walls and, uh, you know, where we're going to be in January and the, the, the architect's um, concept on the right where we were in September 25th, what I can tell you is that, well, the, the general contractor was working with the bonding agent to try and deal out the situation with the curtain wall supplier. They, if you've been by these tarps, are, are the, this tarp has been removed and they've, they've actually taken plywood, put it in, painted it, so it actually it looks like windows, blacked out windows. Um, same with this tarp, it's been doubled up and covered up. This stairwell has, stairwell one is in. Um, the idea of, of them doing that is they've, they've brought in heat to um, control the, the building environment for drywall sanding and, and painting and flooring. Um, but that stuff will stay in place until the curtain walls and windows are completed. Um, the thought is that hopefully we'll see some action. They had been dealing with, with uh, an alternate supplier, and the thought is that we'll see some action on that hopefully next week. So keep things moving. Next steps um, to completion is uh, the completion of Chipp Chippewa Street road work, completion of the exterior building finishes, completion of the exterior hard surfaces, sidewalks, and landscaping. Um, we do have a, a mock-up pre-pour for, for the uh, stamped concrete for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, interior finishes, plant or painting, flooring, wayfind signage. Um, Mill work, all that stuff is tight schedule, but they're they're uh, guaranteeing us that they're going to meet their current substantial completion date. Along with that is the installation of the workstations and furniture and commissioning of equipment and systems. <clears throat> Continuing on uh, next steps is uh, furniture and outfitting. Um, the idea, the current schedule is that the, the contractor is going to turn the building over on floor starting on the third, working down to the first. And we've got furniture delivery scheduled for the first week of December. Um, and as I say, well, the, they anticipate two weeks per floor, so starting on the third floor, which has a lot of furniture in it and working their way down. Um, and then also, council chambers, AV system, and, and training staff and council on how to operate the new system. We'd be in January of 2020. 
office moves. Uh, they'll be uh, scheduled for, for early in January, well, mid-January 2020, but there'll be an RFQ for, for moving services going out this month. Um, and office, office moves will be phased depending on uh, adjacencies and uh, priorities. Uh, there'll be, a, and as I say, there'll be a detailed schedule of office moves and necessary closes, closures will be announced and there'll be a public awareness campaign in the fall, this fall. Lastly, but most importantly, the project is within budget. Very important. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, through, through, through the mayor, uh, uh, through the mayor, uh, Brent, I know we've had some weather issues in the winter, but there hasn't been that many work days that I can recall that the work shouldn't have been done. So on a scale of one to 10, working with this, I guess the consultant and the building project and how, how are things really gone on a scale of one to 10 as far as moving things forward? One to ten, I'd give them an eight. There's, as with any project, it, the, the general contractor relies on their subcontractors, and if a subcontractor stumbles, it, it impacts the overall schedule. And, and they've had um, a couple of stumbles along the way, I guess. With with say. with their subs. Subcontractors, yeah. correct? Yeah. Now, does that impact us, the ability? Um, I, I I know we don't really have no hard deadline, but as far as um, and we want the work done properly, but as far as meeting the deadlines, like they're still pretty confident of this January move? Uh, through the chair, correct. They're, they're confident with their current substantial completion date. And one of, one of the, um, if we had went much longer not knowing the outcome of the curtain wall situation, that might have, might have become a concern, but now that we've had um, that issue resolved, I think that they should be able to complete. Okay, thanks Slap. Elzer Corbett. Yes, if I may, how is the sheet metal workers, they were spewed affected the delivery of product? Through the chair, yeah, it, it had an impact in the summer, but it was, it's an accordion one. So in the end, they were off for two months, I believe it was, um, but it, it, it impacts longer than the two months because they have to catch up on work that was scheduled so our composite panels and our sheet metal siding it impacted both of those and ideally the the composite panels would have been in by now um, but it did it, it it takes a while it's like a you know somebody stopping on the highway it takes a while for it to get back to to pace thank you further questions comments CEO I just wanted to um, give you my impression is this is probably the biggest project we've ever done and it's a hugely complicated project both in terms of scale size all the systems involved all the subcontractors and my sense is it's gone as well as it could have and that uh, any of the delays are a result of um, you know things that uh, the, the, the general contractor couldn't have foreseen, and when issues have come up, the general has worked really hard to try to keep the project moving forward. So uh, from our perspective, we think not only is it in budget, uh, that it's moving along uh, as well as any of the projects that we've ever done. And so uh, we're, we're very comfortable with it, and as somebody said in the room, it's, it's most important to get it right yeah good to hear i think good to hear. Uh, through the chair i just wanted to add one thing the uh the quality level has been really good uh, although we've uh you know things have maybe not moved as quickly as we have liked uh, uh brent's uh work uh diligently with the contractor to make sure that every detail and uh our architect has put a ton of time in as well and they're sub consultants, so um, we're going to get a really good product when it's done. So, and that's that's reassuring. That's important. Okay, hey, thanks very much, Brent, Thank you. for your presentation. There's a motion here uh, to receive uh, the uh, update on the central administration building's information. Mover and seconder. 
If I just could interject, Kathy, so okay. the present we've, we've kind of combined item one and two under presentations into one presentation. Oh. So um, I'm not sure if it might be more appropriate to hold off on that recommendation until the the other yeah. half of the presentation okay. is done. Okay. So I really understand you do that. <coughs> no. Let me let me just get a seconder anyway, Councillor Lawrence, for this motion. Do you want to back up and talk about furnishings updates? Yeah. Okay, so most of the information on this slide was already covered by Brent, but I'll just go over through it really quickly. So um, we did uh, we did the furnishings contract through our supplier that it, uh, is through the provincial group purchasing contract, uh, which is our normal supplier, Grand and & Toy. And we were able to uh, purchase all of the furniture for the workstations, meeting rooms, um, everything that other than mill work that was built into the construction tender, uh, all within our project budget. And as Brent mentioned, the delivery and installation is expected to um, start the beginning of December, and it's it's a several week long process for the installation because it's all modular furniture in the workstation. So about 180 workstations that are all in pieces. So it takes quite a while for them to put together. Um, the only three workstations in the building that are not modular furniture belong to the mayor, the CAO, and the justice of the peace. Just because that's what was a uh, better suited for that those offices um, and then just to touch on the disposal process so what we're doing with the existing furniture in the um, in the offices that we have now uh, we've just we're in process of undertaking a review of those and reassigning so we're going to be getting rid of the oldest furniture in the county wherever that may be not necessarily offices but roads yards uh, fire halls all of that and replacing it with the newer and then whatever we have left over and we're also sorry we're also reusing a lot of it in our basement storage areas where we have our work um, work tables and things like that in the basement area so we are reusing some of it and what's left over will be similar to a reverse tender where we will um, put out for in bulk um, and ask for site visit people to come in people to come in for site visits look at the furniture that is in a location put a bid on the bulk um, items and then they take it so we don't have to move it um, and it's not as staff intensive of putting every single item on an auction site individually um, we don't have the um, resources to do that at the moment can we do a little storage war competition <laughs> <laughs> It might turn into that. Okay, so I'll move on to the uh, the other half of the presentation, which is really related to the uh, community service hubs that are going to be at the six library branches. Um, so this the community hubs uh, and the online self services are directly tied to the Bass project that is also uh, one of our huge priorities here at the county and in progress right now. Um, and the software, um, the name of the software is called Virtual City Hall, but we are marketing it as my my HC or my Haldeman County to the public for online services. Um, th that will be available not just in the hubs, but 24 seven on your mobile devices at home on your computer, wherever you may be. Um, we're anticipating that we will go live with the physical community hubs though at the library branches uh, at the same time that we close the satellite offices so that they coincide with one another. Um, and in the fall, actually starting later this month, we'll be starting our public awareness uh, marketing and notices to the public on those types of closures once we um, finalize the move-in schedule. And uh, we will also, later this month, we'll be starting the training of library staff on the new systems and the website, just to familiarize themselves with the, uh, the new website, the information that's on there, because their role will be to uh, share information with the public that come in and guide them on how to use the online self-services, um, not to actually take a payment, but to actually show them how to do it online so that the goal, the end goal, is that people who come in just to do municipal business at the library branch will learn how to do it um, online and will if they and will have the luxury of doing that 24-7 wherever they may be in the future. Um, at the community service hubs, at the library branches, we have developed a design for a kiosk that will go, so it will be very, uh, it'll be the same at every library branch and identifiable when people come in to do municipal business. Um, it, looks it looks similar to what this will be with a monitor at the top showing um, different types of events and information that will scroll through in case there's a line of people waiting. Um, the computer monitor itself is sitting on the desk 
kiosk there, and that will be uh, set up to have the county website and the virtual city hall right on there, and it will time out after the um, public leave if they forget to Sign out. close out. Um, it's going to, we're going to have uh, the website locked, so that's what I meant by that. And we're also going to have a direct phone line there to the customer service representatives in Cayuga so that, so that if the public um, do have more complex questions, uh, they can get somebody at the Cayuga office to help walk them through the process. And we're going to have some how-to brochures uh, in the little slots that are showing on the right-hand side there um, for all of the different online services we offer, whether it be burn permits, paying your taxes, registration for programming, um, all of those types of things. We'll have just little quick brochures to walk them through step-by-step step that they can take with them and they can then do it at home as well. So the second item that's on the agenda under presentations is actually a, a council report um, and it is regarding the memorandum of understanding with the library board. Uh, this is basically a formalized agreement with the library board um, because the library is a separate governing body um, and different legislation than the municipality uh, abides by so we had to formalize the agreement between those two bodies. Um, it was drafted in collaboration with the library CAO, CEO and it was actually taken to the library board meeting in June um, and approved by the library board but is awaiting approval of council. The report uh, goes in a little bit more detail and attaches the MOU to, uh, is attached to the report if council wants to read it in depth, but just a, a high level overview. Um, it really, um, it promotes the fact that we are, uh, it's a partnership between the library board and the county to provide the community service hubs at all six branches, which we believe is an expansion of customer service throughout the county because right now we have three satellite offices and this is gonna expand that. So the services to be provided are uh, the virtual city hall, the county website service options. It's guidance based only. Uh, it's information sharing and, and the library has also committed to providing digital literacy programs and trying to um, teach those in the those taxpayers who may not be familiar or comfortable on with doing online services how to use them safely. Uh, it addresses, the MOU also addresses capital requirements related to funding, so the, the kiosks that I just showed you, um, the digital displays and the signage that will be at each, each, kia, each branch, sorry, um, the, those are built in as well. And a lot of that has already, all of the funding that is mentioned here was approved in the uh, last year's budget and will go on, will be ongoing. Um, the last bullet there is regarding operating funding and again council approved that in the last year's budget to expand the branch hours to accommodate the uh, hubs and to provide staff training as necessary. And really that is the overview of the memorandum of understanding and the recommendation in the staff report is shown on the screen now and so I think the uh, process would be to receive the presentation and then to have the uh, motion for the memorandum of understanding. Uh, sure. um, nice update there, Kathy. Going back to this community hub kiosk design um, that you mentioned, I'm assuming we're gonna have one kiosk in each of the libraries or is there more than one? Like I'm thinking of the two bigger towns one may not be enough, so do we have provisions for maybe to add one if it's a big uptake, or what is the plan there? When we did the site visit, so right, so there will only be one in every branch at the beginning, but when we did the site visits, uh, we did look for space in Dunville and Caledonia, so if we have to add another one, we'll have to bring that forward. Yeah. But right now there will only be one in every, just to, to make sure, just to gauge what the uptake is yeah. on the hubs. No, a question, like I, it's tough to tell, but I'm assuming that kiosk there, could it handle two um, screens? Um, I mean, it could physically put, you could physically put two screens on top, but the problem is this is an accessible um, kiosk. Okay. So it's built for accessibility. So if anyone for uh, one. in a wheelchair, it's mainly set walker, up for one. Okay. Um, it has to come up, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, I think too that, this will be for a very small uh, sector of the population that, that doesn't have access to phones, 
uh, or computers online at home. And so I, I think, you know, having one in each location is probably going to be adequate. Um, most of us, I mean, can sit here this morning if we wanted and, and pay both water, um, you know, and other bills on, online right, right there. So I, I don't want to say it's not going to be... No. You know, I can see in Ward 5, though, being very rural, not having good internet, I can see them going to the library. Well, our priority, number one, is to have good internet. So well, I know, but we're five years out. We're here, okay. we're here in Ward 5 is five years out, so I'm just trying to be proactive here. <laughs> Remember District 13 of the Hunger <laughs> Phil? Yeah, through the chair, um, just a couple of points on trying to put two units on one. There, there's also a privacy issue, so yeah. so you wouldn't want to do that. It would have to be a separate ish, uh, separate unit. But uh, there are there are the uh, public access computers within the library, and they would also they be, able, be able, to, able to do they, it. They could use it, like they could sign out a computer. So I think we'll gauge it and see how it goes. But uh, yeah. I would just. Yeah, that's a good question. Just also to alleviate Councillor Shurton's concerns, uh, the Dunville Satellite Office has two customer service representatives right now, which uh, there are some peak times where, uh, you know, tax due dates where it does get busy, but it's still manageable. And I think that um, we aren't expecting that full number of people coming into the hu to the kiosk. So I think one will be manageable. Um, okay, since we began this uh, initiative, it's even people are even using online services on their mobile devices at home a lot more. So I think we're going to be okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Very good. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. The increased hours of operation, particularly in Dunville, is welcome. I have a question with regard to the division of work are the employees that are going to be providing the service, are they members of the library or employees of the library board or the employees of the county? And if that having Sunday in the working arrangement with the library, is there any contractual issues if we uh, have the county employees there? The library staff are library board employees. Uh, non-union and we don't foresee any issues with the union we've been keeping them informed with the project and um, basically the library staff this is just an expansion of the information that they're already providing so they already provide the exact same information and guidance online service on online services related to provincial government um, related to different agencies so there's not a change in what they're doing it's just new information that and and actually some of it's not even new because in a lot of the library branches now they already direct staff or direct public and walk them through the county website to show them information so we don't foresee that it um, it's not a transfer of the same type of duties. Um, as I mentioned, the library staff will not be taking any payments. They will not be doing the registrations themselves. They will just simply be providing instruction to the public to do it as a self-serve. So it's very different um, from what our QP staff do at the moment uh, with the public, very, quite different, and that will continue in the CUGA office, that that will not change. Um, but at the libraries, it's quite different uh, than what we do in our offices, not different than what the library staff are currently doing. Thank you, I had in my mind that there was uh, two different services being provided by two different organizations. And what you're saying to me is uh, clarifying it for me that the library st staff will be providing the information at the kiosk. Is that right? That's right. Thank you. Okay. So it's moved by Councillor Medcalf, seconded by Councillor Lawrence. That the presentation material from the CAP team, the project update on the new central admin building be received as information. All those in favor? That's carried. And then there's another page 20 29 as it's written there a mover and a seconder councillor Shurton councillor Medcalf all those in favor that's carried unanimously and there is no unfinished business so under new business, uh, page 244 and 245, both Councillor Lawrence has uh, two motions. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, so the first one is impl implementation of a no parking zone on the northeast side of Glenmore Drive. Um, we've got some parking issues over there with regard to um, several neighbors parking on both sides of the road and it makes it difficult to navigate specifically on a bend um, where a fighter hydrant is uh, located and which a resident knows exactly it's 1.4 meters I believe <laughs> the bylaw reads you cannot park to they're just outside that we've had bylaw over there several times so I'm making that uh, that motion and the second one is the implement implementation of a north north no parking zone on the south side of Orkney Street East. Uh, if you go east from St. Pat's Elementary School, uh, there's parking on both sides of the street and it's a gauntlet. I can't even imagine what it'll be like for the snow removal people come, uh, come the winter. Um, furthermore, with uh, the proposed new second apartment building to be coming on the northeast corner of Argyle and Orkney. Uh, the thought there is as well is that there's going to be increased parking on the street on both sides as well that will promote uh, more havoc as well significantly in the winter months. <coughs> so that's why those are. Okay, any comments? Um. <clears throat> I guess I'll reserve my comments and thoughts for wait for the staff report. But uh, Councillor Lawrence, I'm assuming you're going to move this. I need a seconder that staff be directed to report back to a future council and committee meeting on the feasibility of implementing a no parking zone on the northeast side of Glenmore Drive from Kinross to McRae. Seconded. Councillor Corbett. All in favor? It's carried. And. Again, Councillor Lawrence moved, seconded by someone that staff be directed to report back to future council committee meeting on the feasibility of implementing a no parking zone on the south side of Orkney Street from Argyle Street North to Burke Drive. Councillor Shurton. All in favor? That is carried. And I need a mover and a seconder that uh, the requirements of procedural bylaw be waived to consider a motion concerning the replacement of a transformer in the Jarvis Lyons Community Center. Councillor Patterson, Councillor Medcalf, all in favor? That's carried unanimously. And I'd like to speak to that yeah. too. If I can get it on the floor, I'm assuming you're moving it. And I need a seconder, Councillor Medcalf, that the 2019 capital budget be revised to include up to 10,000 to be used to replace a transformer in the Jarvis Lyons Center, Community Center, funded by the Community Vibrancy Fund Ward 1 allocation. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, through the chair. Just um, a bit of explanation. I'd like to thank my colleagues around the table for, um, for approving that uh, we waive the. Uh, the time limits as far as the nose of motion get this on the floor is kind of emergent um it's a request from the uh, the jarvis community hall board what has happened is their hvac system is basically um, gone um, they've been patching it together for the last number of years there was an event there about 10 days ago that, that a few folks in the room attended that it broke down that was on a thursday evening uh, luckily we had a day to do some emergency repairs on the friday before a wedding um, the reason I, I wanted this move today as far as not going through our normal procedure is they like, would hoping, they're hoping to get this repair done before the bad weather comes in November. So I didn't want to wait, you know, if we missed a meeting or it was dropped for whatever reason, we could be mid-November before it came upon you. Um, that's basically the, uh, the rationale of why it was brought up now. Um, just so everybody, just I guess for full disclosure, it's not something new. Um, the, the hall board had put this on their 10-year plan. Unfortunately, it fell through the cracks about three or four years ago. It's way beyond its uh, lifespan, and it's, it needs to be done sooner than later. So that's just some background. 
and I appreciate you um, receiving that this morning. Good. Any questions? No. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Any inquiries, announcements? Councillor Corbett and Councillor Metcalf. Yes, if I may, I, I wish to congratulate the Haldeman Pregnancy Care on their 15 years of operation in our community. I think they've, in their line of business, they've uh, uh, had over 1,200 uh, clients utilize their service. One of the things I, uh, I like about them is they do not require any funding from the municipality nor the province, and they have a lot of good people and volunteers to make sure they can provide their service. And I should say that uh, uh, celebration was intended by the Deputy Mayor Tony and uh, Councillor Rob last night. Councillor Metcalf. Uh, just a couple of announcements. The, uh, the JL play, playground equipment that uh, was partially funded by the Vibrancy Fund from Ward 2 uh, seems to be a big hit with uh, the children at the school as well as uh, off school hours as well. It was, uh, it's very, very busy down there with uh, the new playground. Thank you, my fellow colleagues, for supporting that as well. Uh, Saturday, October 19th, uh, roast beef dinner and auction at United Church. Uh, it's held at the uh, Ken Hall here in Cuga. It's a great night out if you haven't got your tickets. It's uh, a lot of fun. The silent auction and uh, the live auction can get uh, out of control at times. It's, uh, it's a good night, so thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a couple things. Uh, last week, uh, being a, a member of the Business Development and Planning Advisory Committee, we had a tour of the uh, new mill um, project that's going on, and uh, for the people that were involved in the decision making of having it rebuilt, uh, it's it's quite the building, and uh, they've tried to keep some of the character, i.e., some of the old gears of the old mill, and uh, it's going to be great when it's uh, finally opened, and it looks great. So that's one announcement I wanted to make, and number two, uh, I just wanted to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving weekend, and Councillor Metcalf and myself are both on the NPCA and one of their signatures events is the Thanksgiving um, this weekend at Balls Falls. So if anybody wants to go down there, they got lots of vendors and it's a, it's a great weekend down there to tour the uh, open space in Balls Falls. Councilor Lawrence? Uh, yeah, I want to echo Councilor Shirton's uh, sentiments to the old mill. It's, uh, I was on that tour and uh, once it's open in the public, uh, you really need to have a look at it. The one of the, there was two old wood turbines there that powered that. The one was preserved underwater for 50, 60 years. Um, it's completely functional. Like obviously, they're not going to be producing flour or anything in there <laughs> anymore. But it's something to see when it comes in the floor, and it's like there, right there for you. So that is something. Kudos to uh, the group that's done that. Um, the other one is, uh, well, we got the press here too. It's a concern and maybe it's upsetting. Mayor and I had a meeting with senior staff through an MTO there a week or two ago. And one of the things among many things, obviously we're talking about the bridge construction with Caledonia, but one of the things we brought up too was the rumble strips and uh, moving south from Caledonia. They seem more concerned with regard to uh, the noise and upsetting people than they do with the safety. And uh, the mayor brought it up to them as well that what's, uh, what's the price of safety and the saving of lives possibly with implementing them. Uh, they seem more concerned with uh, other forces than that. And uh, I just want to go on record uh, saying that it's, it's a major, well, I won't uh, use other words that I want to, but. Anyways, that was my concern. I wanted to share that with you as well. well on that note, like I don't understand their defense because the only reason you're going to hear the rumble strip noise is when a vehicle is potentially crossing the line. So it, if that's the case, it's working. I don't understand what their concern with the noise is. 99% of the time, you won't hear that noise. And you do want to hear that noise if there's a potential of crossing that lane. So... I don't understand their defense of their, and the rationale of why they don't want to do that. Well, 
I mean, just to be clear, it, it, it's not so much they don't want to do it. That was one of the concerns that they raised was that there is a, uh, it could be a potential issue of noise and that uh, without having the conversation with some of those uh, along the highway, that it was it was simply a, a an issue that was brought to the attention. It wasn't stated that they wouldn't proceed with it. It just that they highlighted specific areas along the highway that said these are Sure. areas of density that could be an issue whereas the uh, program that they uh, they put in at the bypass along the airport obviously there's no residents along that stretch of highway so it's not an issue and and as I agree with Councillor Lawrence that you know at the end of the day I think that those that live along the highway accept you know the idea that trucks and and noise will carry along that road and they've accepted that living there for many years so this is not likely something that should deter them from from doing it but it was it was raised as a concern sure. not not so much we're not doing it just a concern and that we do have to review it and they wanted us to be aware of it likely what would happen as I mentioned to them was that we would get a, a draft or a motion of council uh, asking the MTO uh, to to put the strips in, therefore we would own that responsibility, and we would we would face the crit criticism if there was some from the community that suggested that that was not the right approach. Um, any other announcements, Councillor Metcalf? Just in conversation with Councillor Lawrence, or also they were concerned about not putting a uh, advanced green at uh, 66 and six. Or Greens is it Greens Road? What comes off a of Gateway Church there? Yeah, I think in in that conversation, what happened was I think there was a bit of miscommunication at uh, at AMO in terms of what it was that we were looking for, and and so we were able to clarify that they're going back to review. Uh, they they as part of that conversation, what morphed out of that also was that it made much more sense for Tyson and his team to be able to provide feedback and advice to their team uh, because we're certainly more on the ground and more aware of what's happening. So I, I, I think that uh, uh, I'm encouraged by the meeting that I think that we're going to have some, some positive resolve there and that uh, there will be some changes, particularly uh, as we look towards a, uh, a right turn coming off 66 uh, there doesn't there's not enough room on that 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 road today to allow traffic to turn so if one vehicle is making a left going into Caledonia it prevents and back backlogs you know 30 or 40 other cars that need to get out uh, heading towards Hamilton and so so that that was one of the issues as well as the sequencing of lights that uh, I think that we'll we'll be able to get back uh, you know that control as I say it, it there was a there was a good meeting from the perspective that I think it allowed uh, Tyson to 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 formulate that contact with uh, with London office and I think we have a you know the starting of of a good dialogue so I. I I guess after a number of years of being in in this chair you 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 start to appreciate when when there when there actually are good ones and and that was actually not believe it or not and i know Councillor lawrence for 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 what it's worth it uh, was was one of one of your first ones but it it actually was a better one than many others that i've attended to so so i want to leave it as a it was actually a pretty good one believe it or not <laughs> let's just hope that this doesn't morph into a two three four year process well, the key is, 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 is holding their feet to the fire and uh we'll continue to do that I'm any other announcements yeah. <laughs> any other announcements just want to say that the leafs are well on their way to a uh, a, a good solid playoff showing this year uh, <laughs> last year they uh they came out guns of blazing uh five and oh six and oh i think at the start of the year and uh, this year they're oh and two so that's uh that's promising i'm pretty excited to see where they're where they're going to land at the end of the year Stu, we'll have a good conversation as playoffs come oh ye have little faith <laughs> <laughs> Even more is watched today. Yeah, there you go. Um, do we have time to nail off one of these items and close, or do you want to just wait? Let's just do wait. It all. Do it all. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we will uh, adjourn. actually through the chair just before we break. Um, I just wanted on the public record that you actually 
have you're still outstanding on a debt to My be paid debt. from last year so <laughs> i'd be more worried about that than proceeding this year <laughs> maybe we'll have to double down <laughs> that voice do double or nothing <laughs> uh i guess we'll just break for uh for lunch now and reconvene at one yeah. okay. oh.